song that we will sing one day all together. So I sat this week with my family. Um, one day I was telling a few that we didn't get out of our PJs, and it was amazing. And it, just to be with family and to be able to just relax and just really do nothing, I think about that's how it'll be one day. Like, we'll be praising God. We'll be together, but it will be just a relaxing, wonderful time together. And that's what I think of, just family time. Whatever that looks like for you is what we'll join with, with Jesus one day in heaven. And I look forward to it. Don't you? Amen? Amen. Let's continue in our worship. Kings of Orient are bearing gifts we travel so far, filled and fountain more and mountain following yonder star. Oh, 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 oh. Star of wonder, star of light. us in this place and transform us and mold us to better reflect your divine image. Be with us. This we pray in your most holy and precious name. What child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? Who made just greet with anthem sweet while shepherds watch on him?
thou art. Sing it aloud this morning. For thou art Sing it to him today. For thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all God. Sing it aloud. If you feel comfortable, lift your hands. This is your last chance this year. Lift your hands and sing it to him this morning. We exalt you, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, for all your blessings. Thank you, dear God, for who you are to us and what you mean. We thank you, dear God, for this moment, dear God. We can lift you up, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, to extol you, to worship you, to praise you, to adore you today. We thank you and we honor you now. Our King, our Savior, our Majesty, Emmanuel, God with us. We love you so much. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. I want to amen. take a moment and introduce to you what uh, an initiative that we're kicking off in the new year. And I want to go ahead and do it this week so you can be prepared. It technically doesn't kick off until next Sunday. But I don't want you to come in next Sunday and be surprised because we might do this praying thing. So I want you to be prepared in your hearts to, um, for what is to come. I believe that regardless of all that we do and accomplish here, regardless of what our vision might be, regardless of what uh, the mission might be for us, regardless of how we might execute that, our first priority must be prayer. And as your pastor, I don't think I do enough of it. There, I said it. Because you can always do more. I'm not saying I don't do my share, but I believe I could do better. I believe I could spend more time talking to the Lord. I could probably be a better husband if I sat down and just asked my wife's opinion. (laughs) I could probably be a better dad, maybe a better pastor. There's always, you know me. I'm, I'm all about doing things with excellence and doing the best you can at all that you do. And I stopped in this year and I've been assessing the last few weeks of my prayer life. Am I praying? Am I seeking God face to face as much as I should? I don't know that I am. I don't know if that as a body of believers if we are. I'm not judging us. I'm not here bringing the hammer down. I'm saying we have opportunity. I believe we have opportunity in 2020. And then the days to come. Everything we do must begin with prayer. Seeking out God's power, his authority on all things. His direction, his will, his purpose, his plan. How do we get there? What does it look like? Everything we do has to be ordained by God. And I believe that God shows us that direction and shows us things, maybe in moments when we're not communing with him or talking to him directly maybe it's through someone else but all those things happen because we initially started with prayer you all know and I've mentioned it earlier through miracles 
that have taken place in just in the last year and within our church body that prayer works. It's not just cliche, people. God hears the prayers of his people. And how magnificent is it that we can talk to the king of kings? The creator of the world that we exist in hears us. Think about that a moment. What an opportunity. What an opportunity. If I told you today that you could have a phone conversation with your favorite celebrity, or maybe your favorite author, or your favorite theologian, or someone that's a big deal in your life, you'd be like, what? But yet we have an opportunity every single day to start our day, to go about our day, to finish our day by talking to God himself. And I cannot overstate the magnitude of that. That is such a powerful thing. Are we tapping into that? Well, we're going to do it together. We're going to kick off 2020 believing that 2020 is going to be different in the spiritual discipline of praying. We're going to pray more. We're going to talk to God more. And I believe God is going to hear and respond to our prayers. Jesus did it. He set the model for us. He set the example for us. Many times going off by himself to do it. And in other times doing it on the side of a mountain for others to hear. And so we're going to do just that. The challenge is going to be for you to individually and as a family to spend more time in prayer. And we're going to start that with 21 days of praying, focused prayer. And it's going to include some corporate elements as well as we gather together. But it's going to rely heavily on you doing it yourself. Finding time every day. And I'm going to help you out as God has led. I'm going to ask the ushers. Where would my ushers go? Warren and John, if you want mine, come back up here. They're going to pass you out some cards. And everybody needs to take a card. We'll have extras if you want extras later. Just take one today to make sure everybody's got one. Listen, the writing on here is really small. So if you need to ask your neighbor for help, that's fine. It's small because I had to get 21 days of information on this card. But don't fret. Every week in the bulletin, we're going to have that week's worth of prayers. So you'll be able to see it in a bigger font, bigger print type every week. So if that's hard for you to see, I'm sorry. I just wanted something that you maybe could stick in your Bible, stick in your car, put on your mirror at home, wherever you find yourself praying or what, by your bed. I just want everybody to grab a card, if you will. You're going to see there, I'm not going to walk through these today, but we will walk through them every Sunday beginning next week. And for 21 days, we're all going to pray for the same thing. It's called focused prayer. We're going to focus our attention and our prayers to something specific. You'll see that day one kicks off with corporate prayer. We're going to do that collectively as a family, as a body next Sunday. Next Sunday, we will all spend time praying together. Okay, show up and see what that's going to look like. We're going to pray together. And then day two is the lost, and we'll move into that. My challenge to you is not only to pray and to pray specifically according to the day that we're on, but I would challenge you to even backtrack every day. So when you get to day six, pray for days one through five as well. Does that make sense? So by the time we get to day 21, there's 21 different things that you're praying for or focusing on with the exception of the corporate prayers that are plugged in there on Sundays. There's so many different things that covers a gamut of who we are and what we are and things we should be praying for on there specifically. And each week I will unpack those a little bit to tell you more about what to pray specifically for our community, for instance. Because we want to pray for schools and we want to pray for businesses and organizations and our neighbors and citizens. So I'll get into that more each week as we, as we uh, lay those out. We are going to pray every Sunday, specifically have a special time of prayer in our services over the next couple of weeks. You don't want to miss a part of that. Here's what else we're going to do. We're going to have corporate prayer times on Wednesday nights. Okay? Not this Wednesday. Not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday. 
for a couple of weeks, and I'll give you the dates and all that next week and put it in the bulletin, but for a couple of weeks, we're going to have set aside time to come in here on a Wednesday night together as a family and spend some time in prayer. Now, that's not a lot to ask of you. I know of a lot of other churches that are doing this same type thing, and they pray every morning at 6 a.m. The Lord has not spoken that to me. You're welcome. But if he does, I know you'd be here, Warren. I know you'd be here waiting on me when I unlock the door. But I have a lot of friends and churches that are doing it at 6 a.m. for 21 straight days. I'm not asking that of you. You can pray on your own. But I believe there has to be a couple of opportunities where we can come together corporately. We'll do that on Sundays. It's only a couple of weeks. And we'll do those on Wednesday nights, and I'll give you all that information. We'll do it at 6.30 like we normally start our Bible study so it doesn't interfere with what your normal work schedule might be or, or schedule might be throughout the week. I believe God's going to hear our prayers. You'll see on there that the majority of what we pray for is about others. But then there are some specific things that, are, that represent self. And those are towards the end mainly. Because we want to do put we, we do want to put God and others first, and then we work ourselves in there and our personal needs at the end. But I believe God's going to do something powerful and special through our commitment to prayer. I would also say and challenge to you that if you choose to fast during this time, then I think the Lord would really honor that. I'm not asking that of you. This is not a corporate fast. We've done those. This is a time of corporate prayer. That's the focus. But if you're really serious about drawing near to God and hearing from Him, I would say to incorporate some fasting into your 21 days of prayer. You work that out according to the Lord. If you've got questions, I'll be glad to answer those or help guide you. But this is not going to be a, hey, let's all fast together. If you want to add that, it's a great additive. I mentioned that in the bulletin as well. I'm excited to see what God's going to do. I believe He's going to do powerful things through this time of prayer. Uh, if, if, if prayer is not a staple and a founding value that we have here, then we might as well just close the doors. Let's just call it a day and go home. Uh, so it has to be something that, that we represent and that represents us and that we are committed to each and every day. Amen? Amen. Thank you for enduring me and for your support. Here's the good news. You don't have to do, endure me anymore. Today you are... Um, going to be treated to a, I won't say a special person, because he is special, but he's one of us. And so, um, so Pastor Philip is going to be sharing the word with you today, not just so I can take a day off while I'm excited about that, and I'm excited to hear what the Lord says to me through him, um, but Pastor Philip, as many of you know, is going through the process of ordination through the Wesleyan Church as I am we both are looking to finish up this summer and uh, will be fully ordained we are both licensed ministers in the church and um, by the end of the summer we'll both be fully ordained pastors and so um, part uh, oddly enough I've never heard him preach who who gives the guy a title of associate pastor without ever hearing him preach me never heard him preach I've heard him teach many many times as he leads many of our Bible studies uh, and other settings but I've never heard him preach and um, it, it, it's odd because one of the requirements of the ordination process is that his overseeing pastor hears him preach so he has to preach in front of me and I'm gonna be taking notes and scoring him just kidding just kidding but I, I met with Philip before this morning, and we had a time of prayer together, and I looked at him, and I said, Philip, this is not about going through the motions and what is required. This is about believing that God ordained you to speak on this Sunday because the Holy Spirit has something that he needs to share to his people through you. And so I'm believing that God has given Philip a word for us today in a powerful way, and I'm looking forward to what he has to share with us. Can you put your hands together and welcome Philip? to the pulpit. So, um, 
normally, if I am here, Ashley is not here. So the great thing about him not being here when I'm here is that he doesn't have to deal with the fallout of whatever I say immediately following service. He's got about a week, and then he'll have to deal with it. But today, you're on your own, buddy. <laughs> Our text today comes from Hebrews chapter 2, verses 10 through 18. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Since, therefore, the children share the flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For it is clear that he did not come to help angels, but the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every respect, so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in service of God, to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself was tested by what he suffered, he is able to help those who are being tested. The Christmas season celebrates one of the greatest mysteries of the Christian faith, the Incarnation. Not reincarnation, the Incarnation. What is the Incarnation? The Incarnation is the Word being made flesh. It is the Creator partaking in the creation. It is God revealed in Jesus. When we look to Jesus, we see the embodiment of God. Christmas is a reminder that ever since the fall, God has been lovingly reaching out to God's own disobedient creation. God desperately wants to figure out what is going on with creation, so much so that he wants to see the creation from the perspective of our eyes. God seeks to see creation with human eyes as we see it and to understand it as we understand it. Christmas is a reminder that God is always reaching out to us with our best interest in mind. We see this in Christ becoming one of us in Jesus of Nazareth. The eyes through which God became one with humankind are those of a first century Palestinian Jew. Born to an impoverished family, living hand to mouth, to a betrothed but unwed pregnant teen mother. The creator's experience of humanity was an experience of lowliness, humility, and suffering. When God became flesh, God didn't step into creation with all the grandeur and pageantry that we would imagine. Rather, Christ came into the creation participating in all the lowliness that our reprehensible world has to offer. Our scripture for today tells us he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every respect. He himself shared flesh and blood. To the ancient world and to ours, the notion of God coming down into a wicked creation and somehow being made perfect through suffering sounds repulsive. As if, surely being God, you should have a grandiose entrance into your creation 
and then upon your arrival, you should lord your will over all of it, leaving the whole creation, the rebellious creation, subjugated and fearful of what you might do. But we see the opposite of this in Christ. In Christ, we see meekness incarnate. Christ, from the get-go, takes the world's values and what it thinks ought to be and turns it on its head and reveals that this world's ways are surely not God's. So if you wanted to talk about the Christmas story, Philip, why on earth did you pick a text from Hebrews? Well, because the whole book of Hebrews is absolutely fascinated with discussing the nature of Christ. Hebrews focuses on the doctrine and person of Christ and Christ's role as high priest, mediating between God and humankind more than any other book in the New Testament. Hebrews teaches us about the nature of Christ. Hebrews itself is a sermon composed by a preacher seeking to address the early church, very much like what we're doing right now. Hebrews specifically addresses a community of faith that has experienced suffering due to their allegiance to Christ. The preacher of Hebrews seeks to motivate and encourage the flock by reminding them that just as they suffered, Christ suffered. And just as Christ was made perfect by his sufferings, they too will be made perfect as they endure the pains and sorrows that this world inflicts. Hebrews is fascinated with showing how the church and how Christ, incarnation and suffering perfected and exalted Christ as the savior of the church. Like any good preacher, the author of Hebrews seeks to help their parishioners through the hardships of life by encouraging them to keep the faith despite persecution. Hebrews calls Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of the faith. Jesus' human nature was made perfect by what it suffered and suffers. In subjecting himself to creation, Jesus was made perfect through suffering. That sounds absolutely bizarre to our ears. Perfection to su through suffering, it just doesn't sound right. It doesn't feel right in our gut. But unlike other religions or philosophies, Christians do not consider the experience of Jesus to be a mere appearance of God or a momentary vision of God in human form. Rather, we insist that in Jesus Christ, we see a being that is simultaneously both fully God and fully man. That means all the experiences, joys, and sorrows of life that we know, Christ knows. Hebrews insists that God suffers and tells us how we are to understand and interpret suffering, even divine suffering. Therefore, we look to Hebrews to better understand the incarnation. Hebrews in our text today tells us he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every respect so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people. He himself shared flesh and blood so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. The meek Christ entered this world to be with us as one of us. Christ does not stand above us, but as one of us, so that he can stand with us. Christ, the one who is wholly divine and wholly human, calls us, the community of faith, the church, his brothers and sisters. Jesus stands with us as a sibling in solidarity. He is fully human in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. 
and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Christ became fully human, knowing our aches and pains, our joys, our triumphs, our defeats, our failures, our fear of the unknown, all of our anxieties, even the fear of death and death itself. Jesus knows all that we know about being human. On understanding the Incarnation and thinking about the Word being made flesh, my old preaching professor has this to say. Jesus is made perfect in the sense that suffering joins him completely and empathetically to the human condition. Through his pain, Jesus becomes a brother to every other human being. When the gaze of the eternal Son of God encompasses a criminal on death row, when the glorified Son sees a homeless woman crawling into a cardboard box to keep from freezing in the night, when the Lord of all sees a man robbed of dignity and purpose by schizophrenia, when the divine heir of all things sees a mother weeping over the death of her child, or a man battling the last savage assault of cancer, or the swollen body of a starving child. He does not see a charity case, a pitiful victim, or a hopeless cause. He sees a brother, he sees a sister, and he is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. This is a cause for a sigh of relief, because we are not alone. And the one who calls us brother and sister is not only human, but fully divine. Thank God for God. When we are beaten down, humiliated, and oppressed, we can remember that we are God's sons and daughters, ordained to share in God's glory. Not only this, Christ also shares in our humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. In Christ, we see the defeat of the master of all things evil and all things that rival good. That is the devil, Satan. We know that with his death, Christ destroyed the power of death, tasting death on behalf of all of his brothers and sisters. Luke Johnson tells us, Jesus does not conquer death by avoiding it or commanding its disappearance as he easily could have, but by experiencing it in the manner of other human beings. In sharing in humanity's, humanity's experience of death, Jesus brings victory over death. What makes the incarnation so profound and mysterious is that we see God crucified at the hands of an ungrateful and disobedient creation. Did you hear me? Did you grasp that? Sometimes I think we miss it. God knows what it is like to die. The ultimate message of Christmas is that God God's own self, God's only begotten Son, came to this earth to experience humanity so fully that it led to death. But not just any death. Death on a cross as a criminal at the hands of the state. But death did not have the final word. And because Christ is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, Christ leads us to the places that Christ has already gone before. And that means even the grave. In the face of death, we look to Christ and know that we can follow him because he has already gone before us. And when he did so, the power of death was rendered impotent. For he tasted death for all. Amen. This Christmas season will soon come to an end. And our celebrations of the Incarnation will wind down, and we will look to a new year. 
When this happens, we don't have to live in fear of death and of what will come. The anxieties that come with life, Christ knows them all. Christ knows what it is to desire, what it is to long for, what it is to suffer, what it is to rejoice, and what it is to endure loss, what it is to be anxious, uneasy, nervous, and what it is to die. But Christ did not let the relentless suppression at the hand of his own creation that crucified him obstruct his obedience to God's will. Christ is faithful to the end. The testing for Jesus is over, but the reward continues for us. The reward is always available to God's people because Christ is now and forever a merciful and faithful high priest making atonement for the sins of his people. Our great story is that God did not abandon us as an evil creation, but rather reached out to understand and feel and think like one of us as one of us. This coming year will bring its troubles, its worries, and its fears. Life will not always be easy for us. It will have times when we will weep, times when we will mourn, times when we will ask God why, and times when we will curse death. But the beauty of the incarnation is that Christ stands with us in all these moments as a God who loves us and holds fast to us in solidarity, forever calling us brothers and sisters. God knows what it is to be human, and in this we must rejoice. Christ himself suffered when he was tempted, and he knows the pains of temptation and suffering. Christ fully knows what it is to be human. And Christ can help those who are being tested, tempted, and seduced by the allure of sin because he himself was tested and suffered. But his time of testing is done. And now our faithful and merciful high priest is mediating and advocating to God on our behalf. Our hope is that this Christ who came to us, a tiny little child, will come again in glory and set right all that is wrong with creation, to bring justice to injustice, to bring peace and love to all of creation. And the person who brings about this glory, making wrongs right and enabling true justice, stands with each and every one of us and calls us all brothers and sisters. As we enter a new year, let us be encouraged by the hope that Jesus offers us and the peace of knowing that we are not alone and that God stands with us as one of us. When this year brings its troubles, and it surely will, don't be discouraged don't lose heart, don't get beat down, but know that God is always reaching out to you and can aid you in all moments of temptation and suffering. We know this because of the incarnation, because Christ calls us all brothers and sisters. And we know this because of the Christmas 